This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Good morning, and welcome to the Monday morning break with me, Marie. This morning, I'm going to be joined by Carl, um, who's on Twitter as a short sentence one, and we're going to talk about mental health and gambling. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Good morning and happy Monday morning, everyone. Um, Carl, have you joined the show? Hello, can you hear me okay, Marie? <laughs> yes, thank you. Always a relief when um, I get the, you know, get the guests connected. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Oh, thank you so much, firstly. Thank you for joining us. Um, I've been really looking forward to this show because, um, you know, I've, we've followed each other on Twitter um, for quite a while and you've just got so much to to say and so much to um, share to help people. So I've been really looking forward to this. So welcome. Well, th- th- thank you, Frank. Thank you for the invite and um, thank you for having me on. Um, hopefully I'll be able to add some value this morning. <laughs> I'm sure you will. So let's um, get started. So your bio, so your experiences. So you, you were firstly a primary teacher um, and then you went on to teaching an SCN school for 13 years I think yeah um, that's correct yeah and in that time you know you were a team leader for the secondary department you gained your sorry gained your graduate diploma in professional development um, and you were focusing on um, you know learning difficulties um, so yeah I mean a long time a long time teaching and I know you know I think from some of our conversations quite a challenging role um and then so in september was it to september 2016 you you'd had a year off sick and then you retired on the grounds of of mental health um are you happy to tell us a bit about that and then uh, sort of about your story after that of course yeah well as you said i um i came into teaching a bit a bit later in life i took a slightly backward route um i failed my a levels and thought i knew better so I, Went off to work, work in quick save back in the day. Older, oh, sorry, rephrase that. Slightly older listeners might know what quick save was, is, <laughs> exists anymore. But um, yeah, so I uh, did a business and finance degree at Old Night School in, uh, well, BTEC, um, and then went to teach training college in Wales. Um, graduated, did my first teaching, practice in a small teaching in a primary school and then went on to spend 13 years at a school pen mice but unfortunately my mental health deteriorated in that time and I was signed off sick for a year and was unable to ever go back um, to the classroom so I had to retire on the grounds of of ill health Um, so that sort of started my mental health journey I, I thought it was okay Mm-hmm. I was told I was lucky to be retired at 42. Yeah. And, uh, I must admit, I didn't feel particularly lucky. No. Um, and then things took a spiral downhill to the point in 2019, I I, I ran into more uh, huge problems and uh, attempted to take my, my life on more than one occasion. And, and ultimately, um, my whole life, fell apart in September 2019 so that's the sort of background to it and then ever since then I've been on a a mental health journey and trying to reshape and and relearn who I am and what I am and um, finally accept myself and accept that what's gone before is okay because it's made me the person I am today. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that's sort of, I mean, one of the things that you really do, isn't it, is, is you're very open and honest. Um, and I do think, you know, you help so many people um, because mental health, I I think, and, and probably gambling which you know if we talk a bit further about that as well there's yeah that's fine yeah a lot of shame there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of stigma um attached to it and I think and it's something I've spoken about quite a lot before about um sort of mental health education and support and um, suicide prevention um and all those sort of topics and, and gambling comes into that as well um that in order to in order to address um, and support and educate people there's got to be um, you've got to challenge the stigma around it um, otherwise people just aren't able to access that help are they and they may like you reach some really 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 dark times um, so you're happy to sort of talk about what what happened what happened in that time yeah of course um, well basically uh, between April and September 2019 there's no easy way to say it. I decided that I, I wasn't worthy of living. Um, wanted to leave my family in a, a better position. Um, so I, I started, I had a small amount of teacher's pension saved up and I started to gamble. I'm not proud to say it. Um, it didn't go to plan. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, chased my losses, tried to make my family more money spiraled out of control and in a, a five month period um i lost a hundred and fifty thousand pounds uh, in total well the total spend was a hundred and fifty thousand pounds which left me okay. with a huge amount of debt that i um that you know i've dealt with now but mm -hmm. while still trying to keep silent and still trying to keep a family that i love dearly together and unable to admit that inside I was uh well I always say I was uh the shell the shell was alive but the inside was dying mm. uh, that's how it felt I just felt I thought everything I'd ever done in my life was a failure I I just I just didn't feel good enough to to walk the earth basically mm. I mean um, just must have been just such an incredibly difficult time like you said you were trying to kind of balance all these things in secret I mean yeah. Basically, but yeah. I mean, I have to say, I don't look back on it. Everything is hard to say at the time. You don't know, do you? But I would say everything in life I've ever gone through is an experience. Everybody I've ever met is an experience, mm -hmm. and and to live the experiences, you have to stay alive. And not all experiences are bad. And I think in the darkest experience is I've had have actually been the the slightest smallest amounts of light that have actually made. The most difference so if i just say for example the day i was asked to leave home was that uh, my family didn't know at the time but i'd made a quite a serious attempt on my life and uh, my my ex-wife um arranged to ask me to leave arranged me to leave and i say this with 100 percent respect because she got me so far to towards my mum and dad my mum and dad picked me up and took me away and i knew as i left the house that I desperately didn't want to go, but I knew I had to go. And I knew life would never be the same again and that things were going to get a whole lot worse before they got better. Mm. But I can hand on heart say if decisions that hadn't been made, the way the decisions were made that day, I, I thank everybody who made them because I believe that I'm 100% alive today because of the decisions that other people made that day. Because everyone yeah. says ask for help, but... And I see it now on TV and, you know, let's talk, let's talk. About, but sometimes the absolute incredible hardest thing you'll ever do is talk for the first time. And I'll admit if I hadn't got to my parents and my parents hadn't rung and forced me to talk to um, a mental health charity that night, I, I know I wouldn't be here today because I couldn't make the call because I was too ashamed to make it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's such an important point, isn't it? And it, again, that's something I've sort of spoken about before and, and people have spoken to me about it. And it's that thing, yes, ask for help and helps helps out there. But actually what you're, yeah, you're actually asking somebody to ask for help who doesn't want help. But, you know, if, you've re if they've reached that point and potentially don't want the help or don't know. No, them. no, I agree. You get to that point. As people have, I mean, I'm quite, 
I try to be as open and honest because, you know, I know for, I know I've spoken to people who've sadly and unfortunately lost people to suicide, and I, I do try and drive a better understanding of suicide yeah. prevention and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But I I can't necessarily give anyone who's lost someone to suicide comfort. But what I can say is, from my experience, is I know that at the time, they said, oh, well, how could you do that to your family? How could you do that to your friends? You, I wasn't, and I would say others aren't either, thinking logically. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to necessarily die, but I wanted to end the pain in my head. And the only way I could end that phenomenal pain in my head, which I find very difficult to even explain to people, the only mm. way out I could see was death because that was a permanent way to stop it. But as I say now to people, it would have been a permanent solution to a non-permanent problem, however dark the problem was at that particular time. And it was incredibly dark and it led to, well, as you know, Marie, it led to um, having to give up my family home, lost my marriage, kids, etc., and ultimately took me, to, took me to prison. But they're all experiences I've had to have to be able to have this call with you today. And I try to put it to one side and say, well, actually, it's a privilege to have had those experiences, dark as they were, because it's allowed me to find who I am today and to get to be on your show and to hopefully raise awareness, which is, you know, I see that as I'm in a privileged position to have lived that life to get to where I am today. And, you, you know, you do you do an incredible job of raising awareness and, and speaking and, you you know, and you do all sorts, don't you, now? So, you know, one of the things that you do as well, you're a, um, a volunteer mentor, aren't you? Yes. I, I Once I left prison um, in 2022, that sounds ages ago, <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, obviously I, I part of well, people who don't know, um, try and explain the background a little bit. Um, you released at a certain point, depending on the crime, you released at a certain point to your sentence. I was very lucky. I would have been released at my halfway point, but I was able to come out a little bit earlier because I was released on tag. So I was monitored under curfew and stuff because my behaviour had been good in prison. Mm-hmm. Various things. I was not seen as a particular... I was seen, funny enough, on release, I was more of a risk to myself, I think, than I was yeah. to anybody else. But that's besides the point. Um then you spend so long under probation till, till your actual other half of your sentence, in my case, is finished. So I'm still supported by probation now. Um, but they, um, my probation officer, who's amazing, saw at a certain point an opportunity and recommended me to this uh, a company called Injus. Uh, mm. And from that, I had an interview with an amazing lady called Jade, who decided that um, I was the right kind of candidate to do some volunteer to train as a volunteer peer mentor with them so that I can hopefully use my experiences to guide others who are in the system not necessarily in the system because they've been sent to prison you know people can meet probation because they're on suspended sentences at whatever but also mm-hmm. to support people on release because I mean I was only away I say only you can't I say to my to our family you can't rate anybody's sentence on length of time because it's their own personal battle to get through but I know even in 12 months how much the world changed and how vulnerable I felt coming out um and I'd say even now I'm still more insular than I was before I went because I've learned to protect myself but I also want to give others the tools to say look you don't you come out there are ways to help you and there are people that do want to help you and there are opportunities that are out there but the only one who can ever grab those opportunities is you because at the end of the day however you feel about yourself you're the only one who fully controls your self-esteem and what you're going to do with the next phase of your life which is why I very much try to live in the moment so all I'm thinking about now is chatting with you what comes afterwards Mm. waits until it arrives because there's no point in me trying to overthink it until I get to that point if you see what I mean 
I do. And I think that's just something, gosh, I know if I, if I could learn that, that would be incredible. But um, I know it would make a difference to me. And I think it would make a difference to a lot of people listening as well. If you can just, you know, your lessons in that, like just living in that moment. It um, takes a lot. It, I mean, I can't say I, I'm perfect at it by a long way. And I probably never will be because I think I'll always be in recovery. And I think life is a journey. You know, I'm not in teaching anymore, but I think we're all both learners and educators because we're learners and educators of life. Um, yeah. So there is more. And I think that's something when I when my teaching career finished, I was like, I was absolutely devastated. I thought, well, that was the only thing I was actually any good at. But mm -hmm. I've realized through support and uh, professionals I've worked with that education, education in the classroom is an incredibly small part of education and what I'd missed was yes I'd, I, I'd missed my actual career as a teacher had gone but not my ability to educate and I think that's that's become forefront at the uh, 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 of what drives me on so like to think I'm not actually a teacher anymore but I'm on a teacher's talk radio show it's like <laughs> well it shows education doesn't stop at the end of the classroom door does it you know what I mean so <laughs> Exactly, exactly that. And everything that, you know, I think the work that you're doing in this peer mentoring is, it must be so valuable to people. I mean, when you, anyone that's listening, I think if we stop and listen to just what Carl's just sort of been saying about that leaving prison and feeling incredibly vulnerable. Um, like you said, no matter the the time, you know, everybody's, I guess everybody's journey in their time in prison is different and, and how you cope with things and, and move on and then coming out and, and like you said like for you the, the world had changed um which I guess is something that a lot of people would face so the world's change and there must be a big impact on on you in terms of sort of worrying about recovery and 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 support and, and coming back out into the world so I imagine that um for you to mentor other people at whatever stage of probation um, must be so, so valuable because they know that you know. You know, you're not somebody who's just um, sort of that, you know, you, you've gone through these experiences, these lived experiences, and you yes. can really tell them about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, which I think that just... That's I something mean, actually my friend, that, well, my friend Jade, who's my team leader, peer mentor, so is, she said, we... We, we see the individual, and they do. They're very good company at doing that because mm. what they're actually saying is, for want of a better way of putting it, you're the one, Carl, that's actually been in prison. You're yeah. the one that knew how it was to walk through the gate 12 months later. So you're the right person to offer the lived experience to somebody else. So they actually see the value in your worst parts, which, which yeah. for me actually doesn't validate what I did and never will but it validates the fact that I got through and I can use the worst parts of me to help hopefully others because there's always things we change in our lives but as I said we can't unwrite what's already been written we can't write the future because to my knowledge none of us have got a crystal ball but <laughs> we can live every moment and make the best of it and find the brightness in every day sometimes it's incredibly hard but there is brightness in every day. I mean, some of the days I was in a cell 24 hours, it's like, well, where is the brightness today? What? And something tiny might happen, like a bird one day. I remember there was a sparrow escaped into the wing and flew around. And it just, honestly, it's this, 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 this little sparrow, but it flew around the wing and it was like, I could hear it chirping. I was like, there you are. Nature's got away. There's always a bit of brightness somewhere. And you... You wrote, I wrote about it and I tried to carry on with my day because only I can get me through any situation. And I think that ultimately comes down to anything in life. We can all be offered support. We all need a bit of support sometimes. We all need a pat on the back. But it's up to us as individuals to make the best of that pat on the back and at least always look forward, even if you're not moving forward. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to say, quite, um, very quite emotional actually hearing you speak like that. Like, when, just to imagine that moment when you said somebody, Jade, had seen, has seen you, and has seen and knows the very sort of darkest and perhaps the worst. Yes. She sees but, the individual. She sees. Yeah. Somebody said in prison once. She sees 
So you see the individual, not the crime. Um, yeah. I remember a volunteer, an officer who just recently come on to our wing who said who was um, relatively new, and he said, "I actually um, we have a lot of respect for you, which you didn't hear a lot in prison, if I'm honest. But that's mm -hmm. an, that's another story. But officers on the whole were doing a good job in difficult circumstances. I would say that. Um, but he said to us, "I actually um, res I got a lot of time and respect for how you conduct yourself because." He said, not everyone is in here because they're, a, you know, most people aren't in there because they're, they're, they're humanely bad. Yeah. They're in there perhaps because they made a bad life choice. So he said, my philosophy was you judge the, don't judge the crime, judge the individual. The punishment aspect is you're in prison. The start yeah. of prison is supposed to be the start of your rehabilitation. Otherwise, you might as well just throw the key away and lock me up might you if I'm never going to get another chance just to see what I'm getting at yeah absolutely absolutely and it's that's very it's very human isn't it that's yes it needs to be because we're all we are all human at the end of the day and I you know I'm not saying my mis I, I own my mistakes I'm not looking for an excuse to, I know what I did was wrong I held my hand up for it yeah. and I think it's coming to that point where you can accept and that's the hard part is for me to say yeah okay I did that I accept that I'll regret it forever, but mm. for me to move forward, and I think this is a key lesson for anyone in life, to move forward, you can't carry the guilt for a mistake you've made forever, whatever it might be. If you carry the guilt, you cannot accept yourself to be able to move forward. So I say I regret what I did every day, but mm. I try not to feel guilty for it anymore because if I kept feeling guilty, I wouldn't have done the things I've done in the last 12 months that I think are are worthy of doing and celebrating because that's now where I'm at yeah yeah but what and, and I think just thinking about that link kind of with um, mental health and you know and then what happened and then further impact on your mental health to have someone you know to have someone um, to help you develop your self-worth in that way must yes. have been a, must have been a pivotal oh, sorry pivotal point um you know to to take that because otherwise potentially you would have just ended up back how you felt yes i mean i think we all are we all know if we're having i'd say low day we all we all know we have ups and downs don't we in life uh, yeah. self-esteem control but as you said you you, you need someone to see it's not, it's not saying, oh, I've suddenly found good self-esteem about myself and I'm fine and I'm, I've got this iron cloak on and no one can get anywhere near me. It's not like that. It's a part, it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of doing and you need good people along the way that will just see you for what you are and, yeah, value your self-worth. Because if, if you feel valued as yourself, then for me, intrinsically, it's going to improve my self-esteem because... It's like when I wrote, when uh, my book came out, I thought, oh, it might sell a couple of copies. My mum and dad are bound to buy it, hopefully. <laughs> but then when other people buy it and you read comments on Amazon about it that from people you don't even know, you're like, well, hang on a minute. They didn't have to spend their money on it. They didn't have to write that comment. So you almost have to accept that you're adding value because yeah. they're the people that really can see the value because they don't actually perhaps know you well. If so it's, yeah. That's how I work it in my head. It's all, a lot of it comes down to psychology of the mind. And I, you know, I'm not, I don't always have, I'm not always on a level like I am today. I, I don't always know how I'm going to wake up in the morning. Mm. As you know, a couple of weeks ago, I broke my leg. And that first week of that was, everything felt like it was going wrong. But you have to try and pull back and see the small wins in the day and uh and and somebody else might not see the size of the win but the size of the win is irrelevant because it's a win for you so yeah I'm not gonna you know win Wimbledon but if I've managed to walk around the block that's as big for me as it is for somebody winning a tennis championship because that's my win no one can take that away from me ever yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you know, talking about talking about sort of coping. I mean, you have uh, as well as everything else, like you said a couple of weeks ago. You, I mean, you're minimising it, aren't you? You broke your leg. You spectacularly broke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let, uh, it wasn't, at least it wasn't caught on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, um, 
you know and again that thing you I, I feel like I know you you have a lot of strategies like looking after your mental health I mean for whatever reason it, it does take work doesn't it you you have to um, work on what's going to help you and you have to keep going and you have to acknowledge that yes there's going to be low days or, or dark days um, but again you know your outlook I just admire so much because one of your strategies I know is you know was walking wasn't it and yes I do um, like to walk you like to take photos yeah <laughs> yeah and then and then all of a sudden you know that you didn't well you don't have that for a while but you will no <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying everybody else's um um photos on twitter though so i am or should i say x or whatever it's called these days um so <laughs> you do realize that like social communities like that also have value um yeah. i live on my own I, 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 so my best my, uh, two friends i've known the longest live a long way away um mm. So I don't see many people very often. Um, so you can learn to use like certain people post photos that I like. And, and, and you have to sort of say, right, OK, I can't go out, but other people can go out for me. So why not enjoy the photos they're taking for a bit? Yeah. Again, just um, so your outlook is is. It's so admirable. Um, I want to, you know, thank you for everything you've spoken about so far. That's okay. We um, we'll have a short break for the news, um, but then after that, I think it'd be really good. I'd love to talk more about how um, we can bring in sort of um, gambling awareness, um, definitely schools and in education, um, alongside sort of mental health as well. Um, so yeah, really look forward to talking to you about that. Anyone that um. Anyone that's listening, if you've got any questions or, you know, you want to ask Carl anything, I know you'd be happy with that, wouldn't you, Carl? Absolutely. I, if I can't answer it, I won't, but I will give anything a go. It's uh, because I think <laughs> life experiences uh, help each other at the end of the day. So, you know, once you feel able to talk, it's, 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 it's worth sharing your journey because the slightest thing might, might help another individual. And I know that's the case for me when people have shared things with me, so... Um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, um, send them in or however you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. All right. Okay, here we it's go. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The Evening Standard reports that the education expert who oversaw a 90% fall in school exclusions in Glasgow has been tasked with driving down exclusions in London. Maureen McKenna is a former Director of Education at Glasgow City Council and has been hired as a consultant by London's Violence Reduction Unit, the VRU, with the goal of boosting inclusive education. According to the paper, McKenna's work saw fixed-term exclusions drop by 90% over 14 years, which also coincided with a 50% reduction in violence. Driving down exclusions is seen as important by many, and whilst less than 1 in 200 children in the UK are permanently excluded, the VIU says that almost one in two of the country's prison population were excluded as children. Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, said he welcomed Miss McKenna's appointment and McKenna herself said she was delighted to be part of the project. However, critics of the zero exclusion philosophy pointed out that schools only use suspension and exclusions in response to serious breaches of behaviour and discipline and that this new approach could make schools less safe for all. Schools Week reported on a new study which asked parents about the impact the pandemic had on children's social and emotional skills. The study by IFS and UCL's Institute of Education also noted that reception age pupils were amongst the worst affected. 
the experts concluded that there was no evidence that youngsters from disadvantaged families fared worse than their non-disadvantaged peers. However, they did stress that economic instability did have an impact on well-being. Children whose families' pre-COVID employment situation changed during or shortly after the pandemic were far more likely to be negatively impacted, even if parents didn't suffer any significant loss of earnings. Jeff Barton, General Secretary of School Leaders Union, ASCO, said the research underlined the need for extra funding for children's services. He went on to say that, combined with other factors such as the cost of living crisis, COVID has taken a real toll on pupils' health and well-being. Barton made it clear that schools are doing everything they can to support pupils with both academic and emotional development, but are doing so in the face of budget challenges and lack of investment from the government in both education and children's services. The Guardian features comments from Russell Group that elite universities will turn away increasing numbers of UK students over the next few years in favour of more lucrative international applicants. Tuition fees for home students have been frozen at £9,250 a year since 2017, but experts calculate that as a result of rising inflation, the real value has dropped to £6,000. This is significantly less than it costs to teach the average student. With the number of 18-year-olds in the UK continuing to rise, leading universities say they won't be able to meet demands for British sixth formers without government support, or they will have to raise tuition fees. The Russell Group has estimated that universities will be losing an average £4,000 per year for every UK undergraduate they teach by next September. Universities have said the decline in the value of fees means they cannot meet staff demands on pay despite facing five years of industrial action, including marking boycotts, which means some students will graduate without a grade this summer. Finally, a study by Myriad suggests that mindfulness in schools doesn't improve young people's mental health. The My Resilience in Adolescence, or Myriad project, investigated the effectiveness of a brief school-based mindfulness intervention in supporting the mental health of young people in secondary school pupils aged 11 to 16. The project spanned over eight years and involved more than 28,000 students, 650 teachers and 100 schools. Mindfulness in Schools project was taught by teachers to their students after completing the programme themselves. Although inconsistent practice was one reason mindfulness didn't work, there were other factors to consider, particularly looking at factors which contribute to poor mental health such as inequality and deprivation. The research also suggests that the treatment of mental health problems is best left to experienced and qualified mental health professionals, not teachers and schools. Full details of the study and its findings can be found by visiting the welcome.org website. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. So welcome back. I was waiting for the two. I was waiting for my two minute tech. And me. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> oh well, we get two minutes longer. Look on the bright side. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I was, I was actually just writing down a few um, notes actually about the the news on the mindfulness in schools um, research project. That's um, that's that's very interesting actually. And I think what I picked up on there is it was one of the things they were saying is because it's a brief intervention. Um, and perhaps doesn't acknowledge the the other things that are having an impact, um, the inequality and the deprivation they mentioned. But yeah, I've um, just written that down for me to go and Yeah, read. mindfulness is, and it can be done in so many different ways. It's, uh, uh, you know, mindful walks, mindful music. There's There's lots of different ways into it. I think it was good to hear it on the news, actually. Yeah, it was. Um, right, so going back then to um talking about sort of raising awareness and thinking about education in schools um because you know there is now a statutory obligation um as part of rse to to cover um to cover gambling as a topic um, so but i i i guess it's probably similar to 
a lot of things that we've talked about before, the suicide prevention and, and other th- topics like that, there may, may be some worry um, or fear about tackling that as a topic um, as a teacher. Um, I mean, I was reading, so in preparation for, for the show, I was reading the um, Public Health England published a review of gambling related harms um and it was published in 2021 um so i mean it's it's, it's quite recent but yeah, things quite re- yeah recent. um and they were saying this was the most comprehensive sort of um an evident evidence-based review of it um and they looked at gambling related harms ranging from um financial um bankruptcy and employment and then to family issues and then health harms as well um they also just they highlighted the link between gambling and mental health issues um so i mean that again is very relevant to everything you've been talking about but they they the report found that gambling can increase the likelihood of some people thinking about attempting or dying from suicide um and evidence suggests that people with gambling problems are at least twice as likely um to die from suicide compared to the general population um they found that mental health issues um, and gender are actually the strongest indicators of gambling related harm um, so they've said here that men are 4.2 times more likely um, so I mean all of this report the, the conclusion at the end is saying the evidence is clear harmful gambling is a public health issue and needs addressing on many fronts with the emphasis on preventing the harms from occurring as well as help um, being readily accessible for those directly and indirectly affected um, but I think you know and obviously from our point of view it's it does need to be included in education, um, very much so, um, to to talk talk openly, and it's another area to reduce the stigma, isn't it? I think. Yes, I definitely. I mean, listening to those, um, what you've just read back, actually, it really gets to me because I I can't disagree with any of it, and I feel a lot of those descriptions fit me. Um, I had I had mental health before I gambled, but I also know in the five months I gambled that I was a gambler for those five months. But it wasn't necessarily because I'd always been a gambler. It was because perhaps the mental health drove me to it. You don't know, but you. I think what I'm saying is that they all come for me. They came hand in hand. And when it comes to education, mm. I, I mean, I've not been in the classroom now for a few years. So much has changed. I do try to keep abreast of it. But it's about doing it in a, a balanced, and um, first of all, a balanced and respectful way, depending on the age of your pupils. And there's all that kind of thing to factor in. Yeah. You've also got, but you're also going to have pupils that have experienced um, family members that have uh, gambled excessively. Um, yes. Thinking of my own children, for example. And once it was out I, I i tried to when they were ready i tried to make them aware of what i'd done and and why I, well not why i'd done it because that's a very difficult thing to answer actually because if i looked in my and they said today why did i did it and i gave the reason mm. then people look that's nuts but that's the only reason i can give because that's how it was in my head at that particular time yes. so and i i think it's probably if 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 i was teaching in school today um I would have it under the umbrella of, um, you know, other addictions and mental well-being, and it's sort of, it's always about transitioning in a way and giving re- people reasons to have hope. So I think, I think for me, I think it needs to be done as part of a, an overarching. Um, I don't know what the right word is. Overarching topic of. Um, addictions and mental well-being and all kinds of things that can affect your your well-being um your yeah. live your life as it is now um but also to be quite open and honest with it and i think mm-hmm. in topics like this i think if you've got somebody who's prepared to go in and actually say well look i did this um i think that's the most powerful tool of all because we expect so much of our teachers um i can talk quite openly about it 
because I've been through it. But I think perhaps needs to be sort of some kind of basic um, delivery that's developed using people, maybe even like myself, so that it's it's relevant and it's real because that's the, the only way I think you're going to help people understand that this really happens. I mean, you see in the news recently about loot boxes on games, so, but you've got to bring it into those ages and one loot box becomes another loot box becomes another loot box becomes a, you know, becomes a problem. So kids are exposed to it from a very early age with adverts and all the rest of it. You know, I got a very big thing about gambling in sports and, and football teams that have gambling um, sponsorship on the front of their shirts. And I know that's being looked at and the new gambling government white paper out, but it's about all of us. I think educators, um, the charities, the NHS, as you said, it is a health problem but we need a joined up approach to how we are going to tackle it because with everything we've been through with covid and all kinds of things like that i think the next personally and people can challenge me on this i think the biggest future pandemic epidemic or pandemic that this country is facing is dealing with how the next generation cope mm. with the mental scars they're carrying from the last few years uh, and I think it's imperative that we we talk about it openly now to give them the tools to to, to be able to to move forward with their lives. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I think that joined up approach, like you like you're saying, that is key. Um, so it's not just a, a standalone. No, because there isn't a what necessarily in different schools. You know, there isn't a necessarily one size fits all. But if there's a if there was some guidance about, I mean, I don't know what what an individual school would feel they like could cover in addiction today but I also know that how I do it with my 16 year old children with additional learning needs would be very difficult to how I necessarily address it to a class of eight or nine year olds when you know that a couple of them might be um, spending more on the xbox loot boxes than they should be for example um <laughs> It's but like, there's always a way in. It's just the question of looking for the way in, looking for the chink and, 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 and explaining it at that level. Definitely. But like you said as well, that, that awareness, that sensitivity, that actually in that class, like you said, you might have a student whose family has, has gone through it. As one exactly. Of their, you know, one of their family members. Oh, has... I would say, I mean, I don't know the fix, but I would say there was a probably, and I probably looking back on now, without realising, would have had in my time as a teacher students in my class that would have experienced what my children have now experienced, but it yeah. wasn't necessarily talked about because <gasps> stigma of gambling, stigma of um, so many different things is like, uh, and, and male stigmas, mm. and interesting in your report, four times more is likely. I know that uh, male suicide is one of the highest i think isn't it the high, uh, highest cause of death in yeah it uh, is male yeah. men under the age of either 35 or 45 now i believe but yeah. so um we are we are playing catch up and men are different you know men and women are different obviously we are mm -hmm. playing catch up with trying to make sure that men know that it's okay to be vulnerable yes because we've been taught from a very young age um or history has taught us from a very young age that it, it it's, tends to be men that men that go out, you know, all the old values. If you go back to the caveman, you know, the man it was the man that provided, the man that went out, and and we've we were genetically developed like that, and we've got to learn a whole new set of skills for men to be able to say, oh, hang on, it's okay, I don't need to be this um, yes. brash male um, fifty year old who can conquer the world. Actually, no, I'm sitting in my flat crying my eyes out because mm. I, I I'm struggling to get through today that is okay to say yeah and I wonder as well that that link that saying you know men are four four times more likely you wonder how much this kind of um, gender you know the gender stereotypes and the toxic masculinity feeds I think it plays on the mind without us even realizing sometimes yeah because that I think that's what it's that's the way it's always been so mm. that's what it's and then there is the case of sometimes you'll see well, why didn't he talk? Yeah. And I was like, well, I did try to talk. Yes. But then I was pushed away because I'm a man. 
So yeah. I went and took my life, but then I can't come back and tell them that. So I try to think, well, actually, no, I'm not going to give them the satisfaction of pushing mm-hmm. me away. I'm, I'm here to stay now. If you don't like what I say, you don't have to listen to it. But, uh, you know, I, I see there's, um, you know, speak up mental health. I was, I was on a podcast with uh, um, Lloyd Stone and he's doing some great work mental yeah. health wise with with schools in Wales. And I'd, I'd urge anyone to follow the website and mm-hmm. and, and get Lloyd into your um your your class schools if you can because what he's doing with year nine boys is absolutely incredible and yeah. you know we need to hit it early because yeah. there's no point saying oh he's 11 he doesn't know what a gang is times have changed it's not yeah. like it was when i was growing up <laughs> exactly yeah i've got a, you know going back to the the gambling and we were talking about you know the difference in ages um and you've mentioned loot loot boxes as well yeah. um We've got the the late the latest research on young people is saying that um eleven percent of eleven to sixteen year olds had spent their own money in gambling in yeah. the past week. I can believe that. I'm not surprised. Um I'm surprised well, it's not higher actually. And I think it I think if we don't look at it, it will only increase, sadly. Because yeah. um everything is packaged in such a trendy, cool way that it's almost like when I was a kid I might have env- envied, I don't know if that's the right word, or wanted it another another person or thought those trainers are nice and work for them now if you haven't got the latest loot box and your other mates got the armor for a game on Fortnite because they've got the loot box then what do you want to do you want to get that loot box yeah that gives you street cred and all the rest of it now i'm not saying all kids are going to go down that line but if you put temptation in the path and what might look as temptation a bit of fun it's when the temptation and the fun become something you can't stop and you've become hooked um, yeah. just by playing a game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're saying ninety-three um, percent of ten to sixteen-year-olds are playing online games, yeah, um, yeah. which are which have all these gambling activities within them. You know, so you've already said that that you know the loot boxes, um, different skins, that kind of thing, and the ability for avatars to play slot machines. You know, it's all mm-hmm. built in, and you know, ninety-three percent playing on these games. Um, I mean, if you relate it back to my own experience, and this is something that, you know, I'm not afraid to share, is I all, I did everything without leaving the house. Yeah. All my spend was using my mobile phone. Yeah. I never once walked into a bookies or, you know, a betting office. or So if I can access it in my phone, you know, there's a lot, there's other people that are going to be able to access it too. And... I'm not. I'm not. Anti, I, 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 I hope I'm not necessarily anti-gambling. You know, I'm sort of. We just need to be much more educated from an early age about the pitfalls of of one little five pound loot box, and I don't demean it by money. That becomes another five pound, and then for me again, it all comes down to oh, if I'd have, I hadn't spent that five pound, I could have gone to the cinema tonight. So what do you do? In some cases, you chase the losses, you lose more. You get into this vicious circle and um, it's, um, it's um, just spirals and spirals. Just spirals. And before you know it, you're out of control uh, as I was. And it's a very hard, but then it's like, oh, I'll, I'll try and get that back and hide it. So you, you I don't know how, you know how I did it. I can only talk, I took out loans I shouldn't have done. I, I, I maxed out more credit cards and I hid it all as I, that's a higher level but if I can hide it then I know that you know even going back to where my I mean even going back to my son who's amazing you had to be careful because if you put your credit card for example in on their your child's xbox and didn't limit the spend they mm. could click and before you know it he could have bought 25 loot box now he never did touch wood we were I was very very lucky and a child might not even do it um, intentionally if they haven't had the education but they might just want the latest um, armor or kit or dlc or whatever uh, and that's yeah. what worries me one of one of our listeners has just um commented on the chat actually jane all right has Hello, jane. <laughs> that's exactly what she did put her card on and her son has spent is it a thousand thousand pound on packs on fifa um and it's so easily done yeah, and I I, sim- I empathise completely with the pair, and I don't know particularly if there is one answer, but I do believe that education 
and yeah. it, it has a has a key part to play because we can't keep these um addictions hidden because we're you, you know the only, you know you're not going to prevent you can if you if you got if you want to prevent preventable preventable suicides for example you got to have the conversation about suicide before it gets to the per, to the point where the person's committed suicide otherwise yeah. you're not going to prevent it it's the same we get you got to have the conversation before it gets to the point where the person's done the gambling otherwise you're 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 being reactive, not proactive. And, and that's something I was taught in school, be proactive to every situation. Don't be reactive. Try and see what's coming before it's happened. Certain yeah. situations you can't. But then if you have to react in a situation, you make a plan so that next time you're proactive to that situation. That's it. I think it's just, um, it, I think it's making it a priority, isn't it? Which, uh, you know, saying that I know, you know, I know how hard pushed everyone is for time and, and resources and and that is really difficult but I I, there's a real there's a real need to make this like I said not just a one session um tick box on a curriculum right we've oh we've covered gambling um but it needs to be um there needs to be a lot of knowledge within this uh, yeah and I, I agree I, I mean I know what the pressures were but but I think I, I had more rain, I'd say, in special education as well. You, I, I don't. I think we were we were able to perhaps dip outside the little bit outside the box a bit more because of the need of our our pupils. But yeah, I I would also take risks in my profession in my when I was teaching because there are some things that I believed you needed to cover more. Yes. Um, than 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 time allowed or a lot. You know, if you've got you know, X amount of GCSEs, but you're uh, a million pounds in debt. Oh, that's far extreme. I'd have, I'd have rather spent perhaps five, five, ten minutes less on and getting the student ready for the GCSEs and done the life skills because that's what's going to get them through their life mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, um, and I think there's a, there's a real need to interlink it, isn't it? That take those areas, like we said, any addiction. Um, is is going to happen? Yes, it's, it's about doing it under the umbrella of addiction. I mean, you, my perhaps that I go in with. Well, first of all, what is addiction? Can you tell me what you think some addictions are? Because mm. it's, it's, it's it, you've got to go from the point of finding out what your learners know first, haven't you? To what they want to know, and then bringing in the people that can help them learn that as well. That's such a good point as well. Starting with their their baseline, so checking. Definitely, their I mean, that's what I would do. As a what what I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> What does an 11, you know, I was, you know, I've done it with my own, um, I, I, I used to do it with my own different things. What do you want, what do you know about so-and-so and what do you want to learn? And some of what they know is like, oh my gosh, I really didn't think you'd know that. But that's really good now that I know you know it because we can take the conversation on to the next step. Well, and then I think the, the counter, isn't it? The other side of it is when I've done education with young people on healthy relationships, for example, um, yes. or or unhealthy relationships, um, there can be a very worrying lack of knowledge or, yes. or things being yeah. Uh, yeah. normal. You can open it up to the two extremes almost, can't it? That some people are almost overly aware, but on the other side of it, some pupils are incredibly vulnerable and then yeah. you have to pitch it to meet the needs of all. Yes, exactly. I mean, one of the, um, the PSHE, associations got done some reports and and one page sort of headers of, of gambling awareness um and there's some very interesting things in there and it was saying there's there's nine items um nine items of of the definitions mm -hmm. and they are preoccupation tolerance withdrawal loss of control escape chasing lying illegal acts risked relationships um and apparently if if a young person has, is kind of going through four of those, mm. they're classed as a problem gambler. Yeah. Uh, so they've got these definitions of saying problem problem gambling, yeah. not problem gambling, uh, which is also called sort of responsible gambling. Yeah. Um, and then at the middle, they've got this at risk at risk gambling, um, which. I mean, I think I, I think from my point of view, I agree with you there because I mean, everybody starts out perhaps as I don't know, 
as a response will go and be like you might you might have a flutter on the grand national some people might be completely anti it i'm not I, i'm not here to make judgment on anybody but no. you can suddenly think oh i quite like that i'll do it again then i'll do it again so you might still be in control but you're teetering from responsible to maybe a little bit at risk and then perhaps you've won a lot and you lose a bit and then you go chase and, and it can very quickly go from responsible to at risk to yes. problem i mean um, yeah I started on uh, Mother's Day in 2019, and by the end of August that same year, I'd gone from not gambling a penny to a total spend of £150,000. I mean, that's £30,000 in a, a month. I'm not proud to say it, and that's based on um, me bringing in personally at that time just my teacher's pension which opens up another question of how it could happen and all the rest of it. But that's not for today's show. Today's show is about what we can do to raise awareness. And I think, yes, we've got to say that, you know, it's like it's like you can't tell. You could apply it to other addictions, can't you? You might have uh, somebody who has a, the odd drink. Yeah. Then they So they're a responsible drinker. Then they become an at-risk drinker. And then they become a problem drinker. You, you could apply it to all addictions sort yeah. of loosely. Yeah. And it's how we help and support the people to, that go from uh, um, responsible to at risk before they go from at risk to problem. Yeah. Cutting it off at the source almost. Exactly. I mean, it's very similar to the conversation we had the other day about de escalation, isn't it? I yes. mean, when you're talking about de escalating yeah. possible issues with the. Not, it's like anything, is it? 95% of the issue is de escalating it before it becomes. Well, we were talking about physical intervention, weren't we? 95% of, of, of dealing with the problem is, is the de-escalating so that you only have the 5% physical intervention. If we had 95% success rate in, or, or 95% of what we could do to prevent gambling yeah. or anything else was done before we got to the, the 5%, wouldn't, you, you know, that's, surely that's something to buy into. Oh, God, totally. I think that's a really powerful thought, actually, um, of how that can happen. And we've only got a couple of minutes left. I knew this would happen. <laughs> I can't believe he's got so quick, actually. I hope I haven't, I haven't talked too much. <laughs> oh, my God. No, you really haven't, but I, I did know this would happen. I said to you, didn't I? We'll have to up. come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but j- just a couple of points to finish. I mean, one of the things that struck me as we've been talking is um, the importance that this support and this lack of um, shame and stigma is also extended to staff. Um, mm-hmm, definitely. I mean, I think you have to have a 100% inclusive environment. Yeah. And my, my first head in special education said the strength of, of, of the school is its team, not its leader. Yes. Uh, and we, I agree, but you also need a leader that sees the strengths of the team. Um, we were very inclusive, um, and it was all about sharing. Um, and not having not not you know making it a safe environment for staff to be yeah. as open as I am now as much as possible didn't always work but if you if you're promoting it amongst your staff mm. it becomes it becomes the norm the students pick up on it it becomes promoted by the students and yeah. then you have an incredibly powerful educational ethos and school to be based in it is my belief. Uh, and mine too. Mine too. Very much one that we share. Um, well, today, this morning has been incredible. Like I said, it's been a real, it's been really moving. I found Thank you. you. And I just say very quickly to finish, um, if anybody's listened or listens back, um, I am, you know, always open to questions on Twitter. Um, I must have hashtags at a short sentence one. If anyone wants to take the conversation further, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, to, to be part of that because I think it is something that we need to we need to be addressing alongside you know believing in yourself and knowing that on your darkest day there's always a way forward yeah thank you for that Carl and I would I would echo that um you know obviously I, I'm on there as well but I would also urge you to get in touch with Carl um because you you are great support to others um so thank you so much for this morning um it's been a real a real pleasure and I really appreciate it My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Marie. All right, and we'll speak soon. Yes, definitely. (laughs) 
You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.